Welcome to episode 60 of the Hoop Threads podcast. Uh, really excited to, to have Ryan on today. Ryan, how's it going? Good, man. How are you doing? Man, just uh, just living the dream, just taking everything one day at a time. So, uh, you know, with yes, Cerebro Sports, you got a, a really cool kind of engine moving here. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a second, but let's let's take it back to the beginning. You know, talk about, you know, where this journey first started with you um, and, and kind of how you got to where you're at today. Man, you know, it's uh, it's been a weird road. Um, I was telling you uh, before we started recording, I've seen, I, I saw your guest list and I'll almost promise you all those guys had a more straight route to where they are now than, than <laughs> I did. But I, uh, I started a basketball league in my driveway when I was about 13 years old. Um, that league kind of grew in the small uh, town that I was from just outside of Dallas, Texas. Um, and, uh, by the time I graduated high school, um, I kind of had to make a decision whether to turn it into a business or to just kind of let it, let it die. Cause it became kind of a cool thing, um, uh, during the course of my high school career. So I decided to turn it into a business, um, ended up turning it into an adult rec league. We grew across the state of Texas. I ended up being acquired and went to work for basically a beer league. Uh, it's called a sport and social, um, out of Chicago. I ran their basketball leagues all over the country and kind of came to realize that, um, you know, two players would both sign up as as intermediate. One of them's LeBron James, you know, looking for an easy run. And the other one's a dude that made a basket for the first time yesterday. And he thinks he's graduated from beginner now. And those two people would end up matching a game and they'd both be mad at me because I would not have paired them with their equals. So I was like, hey, this is too subjective. We should just use box score data to be able to kind of uh, map out if player A played player B and B played C, you could kind of map how A and C could play against each other. Um, so yeah, I, by no means did I think that, uh, that that was needed in the competitive space. Um, but now, uh, you know, this is a few years ago before the pandemic, I, I was kind of uh, tapped on the shoulder and somebody said, hey, I think that you're building for adult rec basketball would probably be a lot better used uh, in real basketball. Um, and so, yeah, I was just, uh, you know, astounded to kind of find out that nothing quite like that um, had been done. Uh, so it, it uh, kind of set me on a path that uh, eventually led me here. Before we uh, before we dive into that a little bit deeper, uh, you, you kind of told me off air that you were a ball boy back in the day for the Dallas Mavericks. So I, I know you got to have a good story or two there. I do. I do. Um, yeah, there's uh, my, my favorite one was. Um, I was, uh, so just to set the table a little bit, what I, what I told you, Aaron, is the, the high school, the, uh, the Dallas Mavericks ball kid program, at least at the time, this is like 2008, 2009, I was working for them the day the Jason Kidd trade went down, um, obviously preceding the championship. Um, but I'll, I'll uh, yeah, I'll never forget um, that <laughs> we, we, it was a pretty prestigious like sort of program unlike most ball kid programs where it's just like hey here's a kid like you want to go rebound like they chose kids that uh that had the capability to like par help participate in some of the drills and you know like pass to the actually make pa game speed passes to players and stuff and so anyway the uh that i was rebounding before a game for an nba player that i won't name uh only because he's not going to look so good uh, but I was I was rebounding before the game for a for a Maverick, um, and uh, one of the assistant coaches um, he was he was shooting he was practicing free throws. So uh, one of the assistant coaches was standing behind beside him, um, and uh, just talking to another assistant. He's sh sitting there shooting his free throws, shooting his free throws, um, and part of his routine was to put his head down before he shot a free throw. And so he knew that this player was particularly hot headed. And so he kind of told the other assistant coach, watch this, because I was the dude that had been passing the ball. He tells his other assistant, hey, watch this. Hits the, hits the player in the head with the basketball while his head's down, and the player just tears into me down there on the baseline. This, this high school kid, coaches are just laughing. It's like, man, y'all are, are cruel, man. <laughs> <laughs> they, they got you. Uh, oh, so they talk, got me. Talk about the, the beginnings of Cerebro, kind of like, you know, what, what you envision with it, you know, from the jump, you know, some of the first employees and, you know, how you've kind of built it to where it's at. You know, um, yeah, I'm really blessed because I get to wake up every single day and do something that um, I'm, I'm truly passionate about. Uh, some of our, um, I, I, I can say the same for our founding team. Um, 
we set out on a mission um, after, you know, as I, as I got pulled into the, into the competitive space, um, I, I, I told you off air, like, I just remember being a ball kid at that, at that time, like looking around and being like, man, there's no chance that I could ever make a difference at, at this level. I'll never make an impact like this in my basketball career has peaked. Um, but, you know, now, uh, or when, as, as I started to kind of get this education about how grassroots basketball works, um, it, 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 it was, uh, very enlightening, of course, like to see, to see how things actually work is, is pretty surprising. Um, I, I have been taught, uh, in many ways by my co-founders, I'll shout out, um, Rob James, um, PD Webb is also on our team. I mean, every single person that is on our, our founding team all shares this vision that the basketball space and players in particular uh, need the ability to have more agency, more clarity around their performances, and just the ability to be able to advocate for themselves. Am, am I where I need to be? And if not, what do I need to do to get better? And if so, who is out there advocating for me? It's our, it's our mission, our shared collective mission amongst this whole team to empower players to actually be able to do, to, to see that for themselves. Hmm. Got you. Um, talk about, you know, the the components of like, you know, you talked about a shared vision that that your team has, you know, for the for the company and where you want it to go. Um, talk about using the different backgrounds of of the, the team that you have and, you know, how everything kind of comes together, you know, to, to hopefully synergize in, in, in a positive way. Yeah. Um... Again, man, I am just uh, I'm I'm blessed to have a mission that we're all centered around. And I'm blessed to have just incredible teammates. Um, to your point, uh, it's no it's no different than a basketball team. Everybody has a role to play, um, and uh, by no means could could I play all of their all of their roles. Um, so I'll point out a guy like uh, like John Cho, um, who's on our founding team. He had spent two decades uh, in the Houston Rockets organization. Um, he worked his way up from being pretty much a, a, a paid ball boy all the way up to sitting on the bench uh, his, his last few years and traveling with the team. Um, you know, he's a video coordinator and, like I said, just kind of moved his way up. Um, but, John, what he brings is, is a degree of expertise around what level of data is actually sufficient uh, for every stakeholder in this space to be able to use. I talk about our core mission of, of players, but we know on our way to that mission, we can serve so many other stakeholders. And to be honest with you, we have to, like, I'll give you an example. We know that, that players aren't going to understandably, they're not going to care about what we have to say about them. If college coaches and true decision makers don't care. So then you bring in a guy like PD Webb, PD Webb knows uh, a, a lot of these really, really high level stakeholders bring in a guy like Rob James. Um, again, they've, they've been in, in and around these rooms. And so we, uh, you, you take all these members of the team, uh, you sequence, you set a vision, you sequence out what it's going to take to get to that vision. And then again, just like in a, in a, in a game where there are certain situations that, you know, different lineups uh, are better and you've got components, players that you have to tap on the shoulder and say, Hey, you're a part of this lineup for this situation. Um, it's the, it's the same exact thing. So as we're uh, progressing from one milestone to the next, um, those, those roles are all different, but, uh, just knowing those skill sets that diverse skill sets that, uh, each one of these members has, um, it means we, we, we're pretty flexible with the line of swing run out there. There you go. That, that's what it's all about. Talk about, uh, your advanced metrics, you know, how they're built and how they, they differ from existing models. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that they're kind of built, you know, out of, you know, conceptualize from, you know, John Hollinger stats or something like that. Kind of talk about uh, the advanced metrics that you guys have built up as as Cerebo. You know, I th um, I, I think guys like John um, are absolutely pioneers. Uh, John worked under another pioneer, Daryl Morey. Um, that uh, there are people that 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 took Moneyball and applied it to basketball, right? Like that's. When I'm in investor pitches, that's what every investor, oh, it's money ball for basketball, right? Um, <laughs> there, there are people that, that did that, and um, we owe them a huge debt because I don't think people would care about what we're doing if they hadn't done what they did. But um, I, I think we're, we're, we're taking, uh, we're, we're laying a fresh set of eyes on this because 
I kind of always say, you know, like 99% of, of resources in this space and my, and the role as CEO, a lot of times I'm out raising capital. So when I'm talking to a venture capitalist, I'll tell them, if you look in the sports tech space, 99% of your money is being invested into the top 1% competitively. Um, and the fact is the bottom 99%, most, most of these players, most of these players that are out there spending lots of money and lots of time to try and get somewhere, they don't have a lot for them. So the question was, we approach it from a little bit different angle than, um, John or Daryl did because they were, they were focused on that top 1%. And what do you have there? I mean, you've got Eagle tracking cameras and the Raptors, you've got wearables, You've got all this, you know, really, really fancy, expensive equipment that just can't scale. It, that fancy equipment and the metrics that are derived from that, what's the, what's the closeout speed uh, that, that a player has? Or, you know, like all of these different metrics that are all really good, or in the case of, of even like John, play-by-play -play data. It's not just box scores, it's play-by-plays. Unfortunately, that kind of stuff doesn't, scale all the way down. So we kind of asked ourselves, again, fresh look, how could we service 100% of stakeholders? And the answer was, you have to build for the lowest common denominator. What is, what is the thing that they've got in a high school gym in Bangladesh, as well as the NBA arena? Um, and the answer to that question is a basic box score. Um, to be minimally viable, we do need minutes played. So more like a, a college style box score, but we don't need anything like a play by play, a shot chart, any of that, because again, we want to lay the world flat. If you go into our platform, we've got about 350,000 players from all events all over the world, all different levels. Um, and to be able to see a player like Luka Doncic progression from the time he was 14 or 15 years old, all the way up till, uh, him hanging 49 should have been 51 last night. I'm a Mavericks fan still, obviously. <laughs> yeah. <I'm sure>. uh, <laughs> um, you're able to see this, this logical progression all the way through an entire career. That's the value of what we have to deliver. We, we say start with stats. I, I would say uh, the way to look at this is in recruiting, it's like a funnel. How do you, how do you narrow down from 10,000 players down to 10 to spend your time on? Um, that's where we help, where you still, you still need, super advanced data you still need film you still need naked eye scouts you still need riders you still need to call coaches all of that stuff is still very necessary we're just adding a different layer on top of it uh if that if that makes sense it's a little bit different approach okay talk about your your pitch as it differs to you know what you guys can offer for high school coaches versus college coaches versus NBA teams versus, you know, parents of and parents and AAU coaches and high school coaches. Totally, totally. Uh, yeah. So th those are a lot of different stakeholders that have, uh, that have a lot of different interests. Right. And, um, you know, I, I kind of compare it to Google and when we, when we, when we go to the Google homepage, what do we all see? We see one very, very simple search bar and that's it. And what that means to different people is a lot of different things. It is what you make of it. And so to, to carry that analogy through, the reason why we are useful to all those stakeholders is because there's one guiding question that all of these other, all of these experiences and value propositions are centered around, which is how are objective player evaluations helpful to each one of those roles? Again, you look at the same thing, but it means something different to you as opposed to someone else that, that wears a different hat. So to answer your question specifically, for a player, I talked about it. It's self-advocacy and truly understanding where you stack up. For a coach, it's like, imagine, imagine what I just told you that the player gets is like a report. Now imagine a whole stack of reports that you can filter through really, really quickly. If you're in the media, these seven simple metrics make a box score more digestible and they can be applied to every uh to every event at every level and there's data in here that you know that you can trust um from you know years back on a, on a player's career now you can't now you're not necessarily just writing about what they did in college in the pros uh, you know what you grabbed off espn you, you can write about what they did at hoop hall or what they did in eybl or what they did in you know some uh independent 
uh, event. It's, it's, it's kind of, it's all on the table. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Applications for fans, of course. Uh, don't know. I, I think I can talk about on the show ga- gamblers, right? Like yeah. it's all, it's all, uh, it's all on the table basically. And, and it just comes back to, if I were to give you a 30 second player evaluation in a simple language that you understand, these are like glasses to look at the whole world through, what would that mean to you? And the answer to that question is just different depending on your role. Is there anything as far as like the player breakdowns, like say, you know, you're, you know, Aaron Proya, you know, star shooting guard for, you know, AAU elite out of New York, you know, um, <laughs> it, if you have, you know, my CRAM score, you know, your metric, if, if, if it's relatively low or if it's at a good level, but you think it can go higher, what feedback is there as far as like, is there feedback as, as far as why it's so low? versus you know maybe like if you take away all of your 15 foot jumpers from the left side you just shoot them from the right or you know what i mean like what what type of feedback are they getting from that for sure yeah um so again we're we're relatively surface level so Mm -hmm. and that's that's by design uh, so you can look very broadly across the entire basketball playing world unfortunately that does mean that we're limited in some things that that we can that we can do but when I say unfortunately, I, I think I actually mean fortunately, because on, on the other side, there are people that are already really good at their jobs that, that can help you with this. So I'll give you an example. Um, if, you, if you're a high school player, um, you're probably using huddle. The ability to, to call those up is, is uh, to call all those plays up and to actually watch them or to look at a shooting chart is all really helpful. Where we help you is number one, showing you at the end of the day, bottom line, how do you stack up against your peers? Not specific, but how do you stack up against your peers? The degree of specificity we go into requires a little bit of just a a reset of the metrics. There are seven metrics that we have, again, applied to every event in the world, every competition. Two metrics that tell you how good a player is overall within an event relative to their competition. That's the RAM and the CRAM where we'll give you like a gold, silver, bronze, or you don't medal if you're in the bottom 70% of an event or so. Um, and then five skill scores that tell you what skills specifically you were good at. So to answer your question, what you do as a player is you'd, you'd pull down your report. You'd see, okay, my CRAM was here. Like to me, that, that tells me whether or not this is worth, probably worth bragging about. If I meddled, that's worth bragging about. If I didn't meddle, that's t- it's time for me to get in the lab and, fi- and figure out why. Now you look at the five skill scores and you see your three-point efficiency was too, was too low. You open up the report a little bit deeper and you dig into your individual game stat lines or you look at your cumulatives from the event. You're like, okay, I see why my 3PE was so low. This is what I need to work on. Then you, can, you could, or your coach, you can jump into huddle and you can see what kind of looks you are getting and know exactly where to improve. But having the, the yardstick or the measuring stick to know what threads to pull at. I'll, I'll, get, I'll, uh, I'll quickly butcher uh, a quote from Daryl Morey, which is the good analytics help you know what questions to ask, right? They're, they're just little uh, blinking lights that tell you what thread you need to pull at. This space is full of people that are super good when you've identified that thread at pulling at it and making you better. And honestly, the ones that aren't, the numbers will eventually bear that out. Right. But, but what you need is, is the, is the yardstick and that initial indicator. And that's where we come in and help. That makes sense. Got you. And there's, and and one last question kind of in, in that realm, kind of talking about recruiting, like how can that help? How can you be helping college coaches that, that, that subscribe to your service, you know, as far as providing them statistical like kids that fit statistical profiles that they're kind of asking for? Yeah. Um, Great question. Uh, So I'll go back to the analogy of like the player, the player value proposition is that we're allowing them to see their report. So Mm -hmm. imagine within our platform, we, we require uh, competition completeness. In other words, the entire event, whatever it is, we need all the box scores from it or else we can't tell you how somebody stacked up relative to the competition because we don't have competition, right? So it does not matter whether a player buys a report from us or not as to, as to them getting into 
this entire database. Like the, there is no preferential treatment on the basis of a player buying anything. It doesn't, I mean, a, a coach won't even know, right? Mm-hmm. So what we do is we take uh, that, that report that that player pulled out of, imagine just like a stack of papers. You pull yours out, you wanna see what it said. Well, what the, the, the feature for the coach or the, the recruiter is, is seeing all of the reports and then being able to use a filtering system within our platform to say, I'm looking for a player that you know, does certain statistical criteria or even we have proprietary archetypes. So maybe you say, I'm looking for a modern big or I'm looking for a connector or I'm looking for a three and D. Um, this audience will respect this. PD played a huge role in the development of a lot of a lot of those those archetypes. So um, yeah, these these filter down pretty quick to the exact type of player you're looking for. Or even you know if you're in the transfer portal and you're trying to replace a guy, look up what he was, type that in as your as your minimum criteria. Boom. Even apply the transfer filter. See who's in the portal right now. Now it's now the list has been super narrowed to the people. And from there, it's on you know it's on you to figure out whether or not that player is gettable. <laughs> we're, not, we're not here to tell you that, but what we are again here to do is help you figure out which threads you need to be pulling at. So that's kind of the, the product is just this, the, the ability to search competitions from anywhere in the world. You, ha- you have to know what you think about the competitions and you have to know what you think about the players aside from the fact that they, again, statistically qualify for your program. Now do with that what you want. When it comes to entrepreneurship, you know, I don't even know if that's a word. We're going to make it a word today. <laughs> talk, talk oh, it's, that, that, that is a word. word that right? is a word. All right. We're doing all right. Uh, talk about the value of building slowly versus being the first to offer a service. You know, what factors are important when considering, you know, whether you're, you're going to approach it from a slow, steady build versus, you know, building quickly and building out quickly? Two things. Um, the, the market that you're going into and the dynamics around that. And the, the importance of quality, okay? Um, so when, when, I, when I say the market, uh, and those are like, the, those are the two things uh, that in my opinion, you're, you're balancing as you're deciding whether to build slow uh, and you know, very, very high quality or just jump in there and offer something. Mm-hmm. Generic, uh, uh, I, I don't know if this is the, if this is the, the, the venue for it, but generic, um, advice is, is, uh, is to build very quickly, throw something out there, even if it's quick and dirty, get initial feedback and then start iterating from there. Um, and that's, that's generically, that's pretty good advice. I would say, um, in a market like ours, there's a really, really, uh, high importance placed on, placed on speed. Um, obviously, uh, our customers care about speed. They need to be, they need to be first. If you're a college coach, you need to be first to a player, get there as quick as you can. Right. Um, but, uh, even for us in the market that we're trying to establish, we, we want to figure out how to be the go-to. And so we don't want it to be, uh, you know, an extremely noisy space that we're going into. We're, we're trying to get out there and get people using our product as quickly as possible. But again, using us as a test case. With these seven metrics, if they don't look like real basketball, we, we know, I, I, we're, this is a basketball audience, so we all know that it's almost like there's this, on the one hand, there's the analytics people, and then on the other hand, there's the naked eye people. And for some reason, we don't believe that the two can coexist, like it has to be one or the other. And it really, it really doesn't. There are good reasons why that dynamic exists, but our uh, our view is that it's our opportunity to bridge the gap between those two worlds by making simple and approachable analytics that anybody can look at and get with, and then then call on the right analytics resource um, to kind of come in behind. But uh, again, if you're ever going to do that, your numbers have to look like real life. The, the basketball people are going to say, this does not look like what I just saw. So we had to balance, we have to balance quality versus speed. And there's this speed imperative uh, that, that was, that was on us, that was put on, put on us by the market. And then, but at the same time, there's a minimal, uh, uh, there's something called a minim- minimally viable product. And in this case, it's, does it look like the naked eye or not? Um, so we had to make sure that, that was developed in the lab. Then that was piloted with, uh, 
with, with college basketball coaches. They saw it before we ever offered a product. Um, we made tweaks, we did a lot of research. Um, and then, you know, you come out of stealth and boom, you know, you, uh, you, you attack the market, you get out there as, as quick as you can. And so, so far, so good. <laughs> there you go. What, uh, what status, what status, what stats do you notice first in the box score? What, which is, which are the ones that are typically the most deceiving or manipulated to, to use in arguments? Man. Um, so there are actually a lot of, a lot of different variations of the question that you're asking, which is a, which is a really good one. Um, I'm going to focus on, on high school. And I think we know that in many cases, still the standard is that paper score sheet. Um, and when those, when those paper score sheets, uh, you know, let's, let's say you go to a grassroots event, like literally it's points and fouls and that's it. And there's a huge problem with that in that, uh, in, in that, uh, you don't, you don't get, this is obvious. I'm sure the whole audience, you don't get any sort of metrics of efficiency. So you can have these gaudy, um, you know, 30, 35 point performances that, that look great. But of course, like, how did you actually get there? But I think it even goes, uh, so, so having a more in-depth box score is, is extremely important towards solving the problem of, of sizzle in, in my opinion, which is a pretty, pretty broad problem. Uh, in our space right now. Um, but, but I think it, it goes, it goes even deeper than that. So like I'd point out, uh, uh, turnovers, um, you know, field goals made, like how, uh, th these are things that, that I would, I would drive towards being able to see. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're playing low levels of competition, like, how are you, how are you getting there, get, getting to those point totals or, um, the performance that is visible, uh, but I think there's even more stuff that's worth considering or gaining insight on. Um, you know, one, one of PD's favorites is foul rate, free throws. Are you actually getting to the line, right? Like if, if, a, if a player is not able to get to the line at the level that they're playing at there, uh, that's, that's a statement by proxy, oftentimes on athleticism, the ability to get to the rim, um, and look, you know, even, even turnovers aren't always bad in a developmental context. Like is a player doing things that, that uh, show that they're attempting to get better at the level that, that they're playing at again, just these threads that you, that you want to be able to pull at from a developmental perspective. So I wouldn't say there's any one stat um, that we, that we like love the most. Uh, so that's a big reason why we try to create the CRAM, which you kind of be, encapsulating of that of that full box score but um yeah you know i think i think it's all about uh being able to look at different categories and draw conclusions by proxy but if you don't have the categories even available to you then uh it gets it gets pretty difficult to draw super meaningful conclusions and it's easy just to track to the sexiest thing which is you know this kid had 25 mm -hmm. how though you know how Yep. Uh, we'll get to <clears throat> some of the more zoomed out questions in a second. Um, but talk about your, your top row series that, that was really interesting to me, um, that, that you guys are doing at Cerebra. Man. Um, yeah, so proud and, and, uh, and grateful. Um, uh, this is, this is all PD here. Um, you know, we, again, we, we feel like from a, from a media perspective, from a storytelling perspective, we help make things easier. Um, and so far so good. Uh, you know, I think, I think as, uh, as a, uh, as a, as a, as a media member, you're always looking for, um, data to help back up what you're, what you're saying, uh, good, clean, trustworthy data. Uh, and of course, stuff that John on our team signs off on, um, we, we 110% stand by. And mm -hmm. I think, I think they, they feel comfortable with that. So it's opened up a lot of doors by, by way of that and a lot of relationships that, that PD has. Um, it's opened up a lot of doors where we've gotten some great contributors that have been willing to, to jump on the top row. Um, you know, we're, we're proud and happy to get grant access to media members that just need data to help power what they do. Um, and uh, in, 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 the, in our top row series, we're trying to give, um, give a, a, a platform for a lot of these really, really, really great contributors that are learning how to navigate data to give us a data-centric take on an event in almost a, a forum 
um, uh, format. And then from there, you know, I, I, I hope people click over and go read a lot of the content that these guys are generating that isn't necessarily completely stat based. So, yeah, I think it's just a matter of, of, um, of leveraging, uh, uh, you know, our core mission of what we do towards helping people out. And then they come back and they help us out by, uh, by telling, by, by, uh, telling stories and frankly, setting precedents of, Hey, this is how you engage data in this space. So I think every person that reads it is like, okay, so now I can, I can see how these types of things are useful. And of course that, again, that pushes our mission forward. So just grateful for, for all the contributors. Um, they're so great at what they do and um, really looking forward to, uh, to, to more of them. If you, if you're interested in contributing, uh, drop us a line. We'd love to have. Fantastic. Uh, so if you were the, the czar of high school basketball for a day, uh, what would you change? I'm going to, I'm going to add a caveat to, that I did not tell you about in advance. If you say the shot clock, I have a counter argument for you. <laughs> well, I do. That is what I say. Let's go. Let's uh, do it. I want you to argue for why a shot clock is not needed because I don't have an answer. <laughs> it doesn't make any Wait sense. Wait a second. Wait a second. Which, which side are you on? Are you saying I am on the one that shot clock should be in every gym of high oh, school. Oh, well, me too. Yeah. Well, there's no argument here. No, I'm <laughs> so obviously I'm, I'm from Texas and I mean, we got a lot of high level ball that's happening here right now. And yeah, it's you completely lack uniformity with the rest of the country. You don't prepare kids for the next level. You do us absolutely no favors when it comes to trying to compare data apples to apples. You guys you see, don't have one? We don't have one. Yeah. No. You see completely ridiculous stories. Uh, I haven't seen these. I haven't seen one recently in Texas, but I can't remember where it was. I'm sure everybody else saw it like uh, last week or, or so, like a uh, uh, a game that you know people the kids along the sideline and they were shielding him yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's just, it just doesn't make si it's a it's a worse product on the floor uil we are putting a worse product on the floor that uh does a worse job in the moment of entertaining people and does a worse job of preparing kids for the next level and now with my scout hat on, makes it harder for us to provide you equal coverage, right? Like the, the data is not, it's not uniform. Um, and so I'm not saying that, of course, I'm not saying it makes, it renders our data obsolete, but yeah. it's just one of those things that when you're, when you're in our platform right now, if you're a college coach, you look at an event in Texas, it's just something that you, that you have to consider. I don't, I don't know that it actually net, um, you know, like affects the, the genuineness of, of, of the order of ranking players. But I do think that it, it affects like when you're trying to compare apples to apples and you realize one game was played under UIL rules and um, uh, you know, another game was, uh, was played under New Jersey rules. Like it ends up being totally different. Are the, are the games any more lower scoring in, in those areas that don't have a shot clock just out of curiosity? Is it significant? You know, I, I believe it or not, I actually have not looked at that. Uh, that's a that's a, that's a very good question. It it clearly the reason you're asking stands to reason um, that that it would. Um, uh, you know, clear, to me, the most obvious thing is when you have people that are uh, it, that that are strategizing around it. You do end up, of course, with games that are significantly lower. It's uh it's not basketball. It's keep away. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And it doesn't make any sense either that there's a, a different level of shot clock at every level, you know, 30 at the high school level. And I think it's 35 at the college level. Right. And then. Yeah. yeah. Where, where, where are we trying to send kids? Like <laughs> where, where are we trying to send them? I just, uh, some, some, uni some uniformity uh, would make sense. <laughs> okay so we're 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 in the same same line of, of thought of thought there so if you are yeah, I, can't, you have, I can't believe you thought a stat guy was going to argue no shot clock no i was gonna I, I was gonna i was gonna make you argue for it if you even had an argument but it doesn't sound like there is an argument i don't what i don't know anyone that likes it <laughs> it seems like it's just an obsolete form that whoever is voting on this tends to want to keep in in, in got to be equipment costs got to be equipment costs i don't know what else it is. i don't know what man else i will pay the 50 dollars to everyone <laughs> we will find you 50 dollars to buy a class it's wild 
so if you had Adam Silver's job for a day, what is a rule change that you would make? Um, you know, whether that's in actual gameplay or something in, you know, the draft process. Yeah, no, I got answers for both. Uh, and I, I don't, uh, again, I don't think that they're super unique, but, um, you see, uh, in the game itself right now, you see a lot of take fouls. Uh, and those are, you know, I, you think, uh, I, I grew up, um, I, I told you a story about, uh, uh, about when I, when I was a ball kid, like it was our job to, to run out there on the floor and we would, we like, while the ball is live, like a game is on TNT, look, the Cavaliers are in town playing, playing the Mavericks and uh, uh, you know, um, LeBron shoots some free throws. They head down to the other side. It's our job, me and my partner, like we get up there, we swiffer the court, like down where everybody was, uh, you know, along the uh, side of the paint where everybody's lined up. We swift for the, all, up all the sweat. We meet like halfway at the at the free throw line, and then we like swift our way back down and get off the court. Well, one of the most entertaining plays is one that we we're in jeopardy <laughs> in at that time. And there was actually one kid that did get caught up in, in a play like this. But you know, LeBron swipes the ball away around mid court, and he is off to the races. I, I think back to that era and some of those incredible plays that that you would see where it's just it's just LeBron in the basket, and he's you know he's looking down on the rim. <laughs> those kinds of plays can't happen if you're if you're permitting take fouls now now going back to my mavericks that play that i just talked about that was very entertaining dirt getting the ball stolen from him and lebron off to the races dirt ain't gonna catch him um <laughs> that play luca take foul it never happens it never happens uh it would have been great for me as a ball kid so i never end up on sports center but uh as a fan and for the NBA, if I'm again, if I'm in Adam Silver's position, um, I don't know what photos are worth, but I guarantee you there there are some photos, there are some NFTs, there are some recipes being lost by uh, by that rule. And then obviously on the draft side, it's one and done. Um, I think we're gonna uh, speaking, you know, selfishly, I, I think we stand to add a lot of value um, for uh, NBA teams um, when when one and done goes away. Um, not sure when that's going to be, but it needs to happen. I, I, uh, don't, I, I won't get too ranty here, but we, we, we obviously look at data from all over the world and you look at the organized system that they have overseas and the ability to pay people when they are worth being paid. Um, and it just, our system just doesn't, make a whole lot of sense um i'm not advocating against college basketball by by any stretch uh mm -hmm. but it's just yeah it's just it's just my opinion that um restrictions on a, a a free market should never be the default you should have good reasons on why on why that is why you're going to do that type of thing um mm -hmm. and i don't really understand any of our reasons behind why we're why, why we're doing that now so those are my those are my two answers yeah, before the uh, a lot of the NIL stuff came about this past summer, I was always saying like the Olympic model, let them get money, you know, elsewhere and people that talk about, you know, the difference. And I don't want Murray State to catch a uh, catch a straight here. Uh, a low major versus Kentucky, you know, they Kentucky already has all sorts of advantages anyways. It's not like, you know, making, you know, more money at the school is going to be any different. Um, no, yeah. It's just, it's just funny talking to some of the scouts and some of the college coaches. They they joke that now the money's just going from under the table to over the table. <laughs> I was like, you know what? Hundred percent. You have a point there. Hundred um, percent. I mean, so, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I I know nothing about that. Maybe you're right. <laughs> There you go. What have you noticed about the different regional hotbeds in the country? You know, DMV, North Carolina, New Jersey, DFW, Atlanta. Uh, what differentiates them? What makes them successful? You know, is it, is it a certain yeah. type of player? Is it a style of play? What do you notice about those different areas? Yeah, man. Uh, at a macro level, um, first of all, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a treat to be able to have a job where it, it, you know, it's literally our job to see all of it. So that's been, uh, that's been incredible. feel very blessed from that perspective. Um, and, you know, when, when you do, you kind of are able to get some perspective on, on what the differences are. So I think one of them, some of them are basketball related and some of the reasons are not. Uh, so you see, uh, you see population movement. So DFW, my, my backyard, um, Atlanta, 
uh, you've got markets that are uh, North, North Carolina um, is, a, is another one. You see markets that are that are growing really, really quickly. Um, mm. Typically, you see a lot of California license plates end up in your neighborhood, and that's that's how you know. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of talent that ends up uh, ends up moving, right? And so uh, it 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 you you have a, a transaction of not only players, not only talent, but also um, of culture. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of the hotbeds, a lot of the historical hotbeds are tending to leak into some of these areas that people are moving, usually for economic reasons, uh, too. Um, so I think that that's, that's one thing. But within those markets themselves, what you tend to see is, uh, aside from that, is a really tight pipeline. Um, so to, to speak on the DMV, for instance, um, you know, you don't, you don't really have players that leak. Once once players are in a are, are in a system, they stay in the system. Um, and there's a they there's a uh, teams do the 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 environment in that area uh, collectively just does a really good job of of mapping a providing a clear path. I think to players from the time that they're young, all the way up until the time that they're going to graduate right like you care about coming up in a program that's going to develop you then you care about having a chance to win at the highest levels then you care about having a clear path to the next level if you've earned it uh areas that have tight pipelines have mapped that from one end to the other mm -hmm. um and so you you know you tend to see uh you tend to see with private schools parochial leagues like uh, this is a, is a, is a truer thing. And so I think a lot of the markets that, that you're naming are typically affected by one of these two dynamics, either it's this mass influx of talent and, a, 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 a talent and culture shift, or you're seeing, uh, or, or you see really, really tight systems, um, that frankly just, just don't leak. They, they map out the process from beginning to end, um, and, and players are with it. I think an interesting kind of to to your point that that carries over to AAU too. Um, I think a lot of the sure. really successful AAU programs they've had they have a lot of the same kids from you know grade school, middle school teams all the way up to high school. And you know some of the some of the teams that that get put together. I'm gonna shout out PD and his uh, his West Coast teams that all of a sudden <laughs> these five stars start magneting towards, but. Um, you know, those programs that, that have success at every level, you know, it tends to work out well and in, in, in the upper levels really thriving in those, those competitive environments. And honestly, those, those kids at the next level, when they get to the college level, you know, a, a player that's played at a small thing or it's played at, you know, St. John's or DeMath or PVI, you know, they're going to mm -hmm. play with team takeover team Durant, you know, they're, they're going totally. to play with team loaded, you know, they're, they're playing with these good AU organizations where they're getting bumped during the summer too, that either at the same level or it's better. Um, and I think it's also interesting too, uh, to see like the difference in, in, as an evaluator, how team, how kids play in their AAU setting versus their high school setting. Oh yeah. And, and, and how that either aids or sometimes messes up with their progression as a, as a student athlete. So um, because yeah. you know, if, you, if you have a bunch of five stars ahead of you, it's hard to, to show what you can do. And sometimes you just need to play, you know, all no right, doubt, uh, man. we, we, we all just on that point, we always say that, that water tends to find its level. And so if you're to your point, if, if you're, if you're buried, uh, you know, how, how are, how are you really going to have the ability to, to show? So um, I think that these, that these, uh, these tighter pipelines, you've got consistent, again, a consistent vision. You're never, there's this huge, I think, switching cost when like you, you're like, okay, this situation is not clear. It's not right for me. Now I got to move somewhere else. There's a switching cost. You have to wait to get booted up, to get up to speed, then to even find out whether or not that situation was any better for you than the previous one. So when you, when you've got clarity, you know, tightness between the AAU program, between the, uh, between your, where you're playing scholastically. Um, you know who your who your skill development trainers are going to be. You know what stages you're going to play on, who you're going to play against, what you get to play for. Um, it's it's uh, it, it it really does set people up for success as opposed to these disparate, disorganized systems that do 
a really bad job. And it's almost like, Hey, you're out, you're out here on your own. Like there is no map, figure it out. And mm. it puts you behind the eight ball. Yep. Yep. Competition from the very beginning. Uh, all right. So let's do some quick hitters real quick and then we'll get you out of here. I appreciate the time today. So um, give me a great podcast or, or YouTube series that you've been tuning into. Well, um, obviously, I got to shout out PDs. Uh, he's uh, the uh, film room is amazing. Um, but I'm going to go with a non sports podcast because you did give me some entrepreneurial license here. Uh, there's one called the All In Podcast. It's it's great. I would I would check it out. Uh, five uh, one one of the guys is one of the owners of the Warriors, but um, five uh, Silicon Valley VC super successful entrepreneurs. They talk about everything. They're all over the political spectrum super diverse backgrounds, um, really good, like respectful conversations that oftentimes Twitter doesn't really make good for. Um, you, you end up, you end up hearing their uh, really great perspective. So uh, definitely check that out. If you can. What's all the name in. of that one again? All in? It's called the all in podcast. Yeah. Gotcha. You'll, you'll like it guaranteed. Let, let me know. All right. We'll do. Uh, what is the, what was the first time that you were in a room where you realized you had a lot to learn about the game of basketball where your mind was just kind of blown and you're like, wow, <laughs> maybe yeah. that hasn't happened. Maybe you're really smart. No, no. <laughs> um, I, the, the, the challenge is there's too many to pick from because, uh, it happens. It happens like every day. Um, uh, I, I, the first time. You know, it was it was probably uh, it was probably as as a ball kid. Uh, you're just down down there hearing uh, hearing the coaches talk to the players. And I mean, it's you know, I like my at the time my my day job was playing high school basketball. So I come here and I'm like, man, this is like uh, this is like trigonometry, and I am in like basic math. Yeah. You know, so that that was probably it. But um, mm -hmm. I definitely have had the honor of being around some really great uh, basketball people and way way over my head. Um, every time I uh, pick up the phone and call PD, for instance. <laughs> right. Yeah. He's got a lot of shout outs, but he deserves it. Uh, let's talk about the best player you've seen who never made it to the league. Ooh, yeah, that was uh, that was a tough one. Um, I think Lynn Bias is probably what I have to go with. Mm -hmm. I wish I had some numbers on him to be able to provide, but just the degree of the degree of hype that he was uh, about to walk into the league with um, was uh, was was pretty pretty high. Um, so that was yeah, obviously a you know a real a real blow to, to basketball, honestly. Yeah, tough one, and at, and at the the college level, but also the pro level too. I actually live in College Park, Maryland, so it's, a, it's right right <laughs> around the corner from me. Here. So, yeah, uh, a historical or current coach you wish you could have played for. So in some ways I do play for him. Uh, he's, he's one of our, uh, one of our, early, he was our earliest investor coach, John Beeline. Mm. Um, he, uh, again, I, I had the privilege to, to spend um, d decent amounts of time with him and the amount of knowledge he has uh, about life in general. Um, and then, you know, the relationships I I've seen that he has with his, with his former players. And I've been to almost every one of his stops along his coaching uh, career and every time you go there and it, uh, every time you go there um, it's always man I wish we could have kept him longer mm. uh, I, I, I would have loved to play for coach mm. upstate New York stand up <laughs> I'm actually from yes sir Virginia, so we're, we're killing yeah uh, you talk are, about uh, talk about NIL um, you know just a, a, some quick thoughts about you know how, how it's panning out and what, what you anticipate it from going forward we talked about it a little bit before um, the, 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 the heart of it, which is it's great for the game. It's great for kids. Um, at the end of the day, uh, uh, obviously, I, like, like I said, I mean, it's my belief that there are absolutely times that free markets shouldn't be allowed to run, run rampant. I'm not an anti-regulation person, but you always, by default, like you have to make it make sense. And um, in this case, uh, you know, athletes were being victimized, uh, to, to be completely honest with you. And, um, yeah, to see, to see, uh, kids, um, at, at all levels, uh, increasingly at, at, at all levels, be able to just get what they're due, uh, is absolutely the right thing. I mean, we, we all know this, all of us played at some point, I'm pretty sure, um, it doesn't last forever. Uh, get, get it while you can, please. Uh, so I'm, I'm really happy to see it. 
Uh, MJ or LeBron? Well, uh, <laughs> as a numbers guy, I have to tell you, it depends on what you're looking for. Uh, if you're looking for, uh, if you're looking for hot and bright, uh, bur- burning, burning quickly and 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 hot, that was uh, that was MJ. But I mean, if you're looking for slow and steady and still pretty hot, uh, you are uh, Le- LeBron's your guy. Now, I obviously I'm I'm 30 years old, so I really grew up uh, in the LeBron era. So. Um, my personal preference is is LeBron, uh, I think. But, you know, those guys are just – they're so hard to compare. And, you know, <laughs> finesse and skill, MJ, uh, raw athleticism, most talented athlete walking the face of the planet. Um, probably do ever. Do not LeBron. think a Mavericks fan would be this pro LeBron. <laughs> Look, I'm, a, I'm objective. I, I am here. We, we are on a mission to make this space objective. And if I'm being objective with you, man, there's, uh, there's not, not a better, not, not a, not a better athlete out there than, than LeBron James. There you go. So this one's more objective. Take a charge from Shaq or try to guard KD with the game in the line. Oh yeah. I, I got you there. Uh, both of them are, it's a lose, lose, but I, I'm taking the charge from Shaq. Oh, wow. Assume, assuming I survive, that's a risk. <laughs> I'll, I will grant you that there is risk involved in that. You do have, However, assuming you do have kids, man. <laughs> you haven't asked about my life insurance policy. They're going to be fine. All right. <laughs> assuming I survive, I'm not going to end up in the photo because I'm going to be on the ground, right? And the, the, the angle, you're just going to see Shaq hanging from the rim. I'm not even in there. Whereas if I'm trying to guard KD, you're going to see, you're going to see me right here. On the front page of the Times, see that's you not right here. For. Yeah, see me. Yeah, see me right there. I don't know. Maybe I don't make the photo in either one. I might need to rethink this. Uh, what's the best dynasty you've seen? Oh God! Again, it it's it always depends on what you're looking for. So I got to admit, I know almost nothing about the Celtics um, back back in the day, other than you know, if you're looking for quantity, they got it. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I think I think the happy medium uh, is would, would be the Bulls. Um, but I was obviously uh, the whole audience. We were all here collectively for for the Warriors run, which was insane. And what I asked myself when I'm when I'm thinking about this question is. What, what was the superior play style like basketball evol- has evolved as it has mm. for reasons and yeah like what what team played during the greatest era i mean it you you're like weighting accomplishments to me versus versus era and i know that it's near impossible to say to say one era is better than another other than again to say there's such thing as an evolutionary process and in that process aren't we constantly getting rid of the bad and bringing on the good and if so, like, I think you you find your way to the Warriors. But um, again, man, they're all just so different. And you really, I hate to pick because I, I just, I, I love and respect them all, you know. You can pick the one-year dynasty of Dirk. <laughs> was... That's my favorite dynasty. That's right. <laughs> that was a dynasty right there. Give me an under. I, I, what, I, what, I, what I will argue with you on, on that one, greatest single player uh, playoff performance or playoff run of all time i will i i I, i'm here for that i've been waiting for a national stage to duke this one out (laughs) so if you're if you want it i'm here let's do it uh i mean do do your homework and then we'll do it i like (laughs) but as you as you do as you do just count how many all-stars were beat by a single all-star team that's the, that's my thesis that's my thesis my my best friend's a Mavs fan so i'm i'm very very in tune with that argument we'll we'll, right we'll, we'll have that one out there <laughs> all right so uh give me an underrated twitter follow i've talked to a a, a shockingly uh low number of people that follow pd web uh so I, I everybody i talk to claims to be a basketball fan and if you are i, I know that we've we've way overdone it on the number of shout outs but <laughs> um it's 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 pd the fact that that dude doesn't have you know two hundred thousand followers is uh is an atrocity yeah yeah no that's true all right uh hardest shot in basketball and i got two left and we'll get out of here 
unguarded five to eight feet. Mm. You don't know what to do. You don't know, like you catch the ball and you don't know, like you're like, I'm here. Do I shoot a jump shot? Do I uh, put up a floater? Do I just, you know, take a, a, a power dribble towards the rim? Like, it's just, you're in no man's land. That's the toughest. Yeah. I, especially on the fast break. I always hated being in that spot. Yes. Um, God, yes. I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to troll you right now. I've, I've seen this a lot on Twitter and I want you to defend it. Uh, Luca is the Slovenian Russell Westbrook. <laughs> no, <laughs> God, no. Um, one thing I did say when Luca was drafted uh, is that there's going to be a year where he averages a triple double. Yeah. But the, uh, yeah, the, the difference uh, there's, there's a huge difference in the, <laughs> the vision that he's got uh, the better, the better comp. Look, look, I'm, I, I, you heard me, man. I'm, a, I'm objective. Okay. I'm objective, but I watch this guy every night and I am, I am telling you, LeBron James with less athleticism or maybe maybe a better comp would be like Magic Johnson-esque, but like Russell Westbrook's a horrible comp. <laughs> a horrible comp. We're I talking think a more, different class. I think they're more talking about the statistical comp, comp but I'm, I'm not saying I'm on board with them. I'm just saying that I, I knew it would be interesting to, to run over that with you. All right, so my, my last question for you is, you know, what's coming next with Cerebro Sports? What do you have coming down the pipeline that you want to discuss about there? Man, uh, yeah, I'm ready for the, ready for the shameless plug. Um, <laughs> I would just say uh, we have launched a, a new model. Um, we're, de- we're totally different than – any other company in this space, because most companies, like I said, they focus on that top selling that top 1%. They charge huge data license fees, you know, to, to their customers because they're big, they're big corporations. Well, we've tried to give more access to, to, to players, more visibility to players. So we make the price point for colleges really, really low. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, we were like, Hey, why don't we just open this up to the general public? So literally any person in the world can go sign up for a Cerebro account at Cerebrosports.com follow the prompts, go sign up for an account. You will be able to see for free. You'll be able to see all of the men's division one basketball and all of the NBA. Um, Just like we show, uh, you know, these, these high power stakeholders. And then, you know, you're able, you're able to search for any player, any of the 350,000 players. So you search for high school prospects, current, you know, anybody, international prospects, anybody you want um, and run uh, reports. Um, If you, if you want to, we charge for those reports, but again, like you can get started looking at the entire world completely for free. So that's my, that's my plug is, is the launch of our new uh, freemium model. Very cool. So the last part of every pod is I, I kind of flip the tables on you and ask if you have any questions for me. Yes, absolutely. Um, so my big, my big question is, uh, you know, I love my job and I'm super passionate about what I do every single day, but uh, you know, it takes, it takes a toll. So I've always thought, you know, one day after I'm ready to like, just pack it up and, uh, stay, stay in one place for a while. Like maybe I should coach high school, but like, maybe I could try to get into coaching high school basketball. So I would love to ask about that because I don't think that it's a less taxing job. I just think that it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a place that like, I could go, go deep instead of really, really wide. So mm. I'm just curious what that's, what that's even like. I don't know. Uh, it's been interesting. Cause when I was at the math, I was a freshman, uh, assistant coach. And then I was also doing video for varsity. So I was, on, I was around varsity a little bit. Um, freshman is really just, it, it's, it's fun in, in the, the basketball sense where it's just, it's just a lab. If I saw a defense that I really want to throw out there, if there's a play I saw, you know, in, in some game in, you know, Latvia that I really I saw on Twitter and I was like, that looks awesome. Let, let me see what it looks like in a freshman setting. So where I feel like the, ta- the talent level is pretty equal for the most part. Um, yeah. Some teams that are bigger, some teams that have better guards. But for, for that at that level, it's really just for the love of the game. The, the, the kids that, you know, grew up playing there, they just like playing it for fun. Um, JV level is interesting. Um, <laughs> the first, I found that the first month or two of both freshman and JV basketball is the, the, some of the best players being upset that they're not on the level higher. 
Um, and so they're in the yeah. feelings and you just have to kind of keep coaching them along and then eventually they buy yeah. and they get into it. And then the last like a couple weeks of the season, uh, they, they tend to start tuning out because there isn't, you know, the same hype with, with varsity or at that point, the team's been together, you know, this is, you know, end of February. So February, January, December, November, October, you know, yeah, you know, that's, that's six months together hear my voice yell at you to, to finish your sprint and stuff like that. So sometimes they kind <laughs> yeah. of the coaches too. Varsity is kind of where, you know, everyone's kind of cutting their teeth at, but still to a certain level is depends what level you're coaching at. I mean, I've been blessed to be coaching at some, some big programs that, that have big time players. Um, and it, it's been interesting to see how coaches treat the star players differently um, but fairly, if that makes sense. So it's not, yeah. a equal, it's not, it's not the same type of, I uh, honestly, like sometimes with, with some of the, the, the five-star kids I've been around, it's, you know, you give them a day off here because their body's really beat up and they're about to play another one. And, you know, the 15th guy on the end of your bench, you're not giving him that same leisure. Um, but at, at least with me, uh, of my best. He doesn't player. even want it. There's a minute's vacuum. Now, now you can split. <laughs> yeah, right. They want as much burn as they can. Um, but with, um, you know, with, with the star players, I'm, I'm really hard on them. And, and coach Pratt is, is too. And uh, coach Jones was at the Matha um, was, was not leaning at all with them. Um, you know, if they're making a mistake, if they're not yelling at them in front of everyone, you best believe they're getting subbed out and they're, they're going to, they're going to catch an earful. So, I think uh, a lot of the time when when fans come to the game and they think that there's star treatment for a certain player, that's because they don't see that the work that's been put in practice. I think that context is missing a lot of the time too. Um, because if you're doing what you're supposed to do in practice and you put in a significant more amount of work than than the players around you, um, we'll give you a little bit longer leash in game, you know, because we expect more out of you. So, you know, what? Yeah. what's... what's much is given much is required you know that that whole thing you know if, if you want to be a leader and have the c on your chest and you know all these girls interested in you because <laughs> you know that you're the you're the hot shot on varsity that's yep. going to come with a lot of responsibility when when i'm really frustrated with the seventh player on our team you know a lot of the time if if it doesn't work out when, when i'm calling him out in, in practice or, or kind of pulling him to the side i i will find the best player be like Come here. <laughs> You're going to go talk to him because I'm sick of talking to him. And if I can get a penny, a penny every time I hear that from college coaches, from, you know, uh, the high school coaches I've been around from AU coaches, I mean, uh, the best, the best teams are, are player driven um, and player led. And, and that's really yeah. a lot of the value that I've seen. And, and it's just for the love of the game at this level for a lot of the kids. Um, when you get to the college level, it's a job, you know, at the division two. Division one NAI level, you know, especially the JUCO level, you know, you're you're fighting tooth yeah. and nail just to beat out some guy that you don't have no relationship with before this year. So uh it's it's been very yeah. interesting. That was a very long-winded answer, but I, I hope you got what you want. Well, <laughs> what I what I learned more than anything is that there's a lot more that I need to learn about it. And uh man, the high school high school coaches, uh yourself included, are are definitely out there doing the Lord's work. Appreciate you guys. Uh uh, hopefully uh hopefully one day somebody will hire me we'll see we'll see <laughs> I, I think you'll be able to find your own job there's a lot of high school jobs open in the country. <laughs> maybe yes. maybe yes. we'll see talk about uh where where the people can find you on social media and find us uh, for sports as well yeah you know i'm pretty boring follow uh but you can find me at ryan gerardo uh, no rmg builds handle changed uh at rmg builds on twitter um uh, but most importantly, go check out Cerebro Sports, just at, at Cerebro Sports. Uh, if I ever tweet anything interesting, um, it'll end up retweeted by that account, probably. Uh, <laughs> they, they do a pretty good job filtering my stuff. So if you want two for one, just go check them out. There you so go. at Cerebro Sports. All right. Appreciate the time today, Ryan. Take care. Thanks, Aaron. See ya.